Andrew R. Oh, this is a really good question. Uh, not that the others weren't great questions, <laughs> but I really like this one. Uh, for someone who would be ready to break away from a garage shop into a dedicated space, what did you look for when looking for your space? How did you go about finding these locations? Okay, um, this is a wonderful question because just as every shop is unique, every space you could put a shop into is unique. So I, I absolutely can't give you any specific guidelines of what to look for. Um, I will tell you the origin story of this space is that my wife and I moved here into the mission in 2010. Well, we moved into our house that we currently have in the mission. I've been living here for on and off for most of my 30 years in San Francisco. But we moved into our place uh, here in the mission in 2010. And up until then, I had had my shop in the garage of our place that was over in Sunnyside, another San Francisco neighborhood. And we considered... Both of us, like, should my shop just clock to the garage here at, uh, at, at uh, in the mission? But it's the mission. There's no parking here. You can't give up a parking space. That's ridiculous. So I knew I couldn't put my shop in the house. Actually, I hadn't quite fully embraced that I couldn't put my shop in the house, but that was the conclusion I was, like, rapidly heading towards when my wife pointed out, you know, this used to be an industrial neighborhood. If we just spend some time looking, we should be able to find something. And so, uh, sure enough, uh, I we spent about seven or eight months looking at a bunch of different commercial spaces here in the Mission. and. None of them were perfect. None of them were perfect, but you got to look at a bunch of spaces to kind of dial into what you really think you need. You got to just look at spaces. That's the first thing is you got to log the institutional knowledge of like what's out there. And then you talk to the to the rental agents, you talk to the realtors that you're talking to, you ask them about other inventory they might have. Um, when I saw this space, it had no floor. This was an auto shop from the early part of the 20th century. And as such, the floor slant from the front door all the way back to where I'm sitting. Where I'm sitting here, I am about 18 to 20 inches above empty space. Um, and so we, I, I had to have the floor built here when I moved in uh, at a fair bit of an expense, but it's inch and a half inch and a quarter tongue in groove plywood i made sure that the floor was spec to handle both the mill and the lathe times two uh and it has handled those great um but this wasn't a perfect space this was a former marble cutting shop when i moved in here uh there was dust everywhere we power washed the whole interior of this and we still didn't get all the dust um and it took me a while to understand the possibilities that were here I was looking at this raw space with no floor, the slant. I didn't know how that was going to work. And slowly it dawned on me and the team that, oh, no, I think I could move in here. Um, so when you are going out and looking at potential spaces, the first step is to go look at a bunch. And don't get too attached at the first couple that you see because you'll want to solve this problem. I saw a dentist's office around the corner here, and I was like, oh, this I can make this work. And my assistant at the time was like, I don't think you can. And I don't think you need to. She was she was really smart about it. She was like, wait. And then she was the one that saw this space and was like, S open your eyes a little wider and see the possibilities here because there are a lot. And she was absolutely right. Um, but this specific transition, Andrew R., that you're asking about, the transition from moving from a garage shop to paying money for a real shop that's not in your house, that is... That is such a coming of age as a maker. That is a real moment. Um, and it like it was a great moment for me when I finally did it. I think, am I right? This is, yeah, this here is the first shop I've ever had that wasn't in my house. Yeah, that's true. This is the first shop I've ever had that wasn't somehow cobbled into my house or my apartment or my basement. Um, and I mean, I remember when Ryan Nagata moved into his first space. We talked about it a lot. Uh, and he's had one or two spaces since then. Um, it's a scary transition. You're starting to make a little money with the making that you do. You feel, or you simply feel like its priority is high enough in your life that you want to pay for the expense of having that studio space. I have a good friend who rented a painting studio during COVID because he wanted to paint. And he rents this space in a communal space of a bunch of other painters and, and artists. And it changed his life. 
being able to go there uh, in the afternoons and dial into dial into his thing. I, I, I'm a big believer in ascertaining that that has a bona fide financial value to you and allocating a certain amount of your income to go do it. Um, it's a highly empowering decision. Uh, and in order to answer that decision, in order to solve that problem, yeah, my, my advice is see as many spaces as you can. Comb through Craigslist. Uh, meet realtors, ask them about other inventory, go look at spaces that sound like they might not be great. And you're going to find you have weird points of view that you didn't expect. Like, oh, I'd really like it to be drivable to a sandwich or walkable to a uh, public transit. Those are real considerations that you that you must consider. I was really happy with this space because it is close to public transit. It makes it easy for me to ask people to come here. It's easy to find, easy to park near. Uh, it's been nearly ideal, except for some difficulties in the neighborhood. <laughs> okay, a good portion of us have had our cars broken into across the street here, and that's a real, that's a messed up consideration that that has to be taken into account. And it's one of the reasons that I, you know, that we are considering moving in some way. Ha! Huh. It's just even saying that fills me with such both anxiety and excitement at the same time. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, um. Oh, Cypherian has this question, which I really enjoyed. Uh, Cypherian wants to know, as you work on the road, do you pack up tools and equipment from the cave or do you have another set of your normally needed tools based on the job? If you have a separate set, could you possibly do a video on your mobile setup? This is a great, great question. I do not have a second set of tools just for traveling. I make that set of tools by going shopping in here in the shop when it's time for me to travel. Um, and I don't, and I rarely bring a big set of tools. I usually think through what are the things that would be, that are easy for me to bring that would be like, make my life really difficult if I didn't have them. So like when I headed to New York with my Ghostbusters, uh, with my whole Ghostbusters uh, get up, I didn't bring all the tools I might need for handling everything. I didn't bring a saw. I really couldn't imagine a circumstance in which I was going to need to saw something. But I brought lots of different kinds of tape for repair and dressing. I brought uh, CA glue. That goes in almost every road kit I ever make, plus an accelerator for the CA glue. I brought a little uh, kit of some small nuts and bolts. I brought a few drill bits. Uh, Let's see, what else? I always bring a blade of some kind, an X-Acto blade or a mat knife. I always bring a thwacker. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, I always pack some kind of little hammer of some, of some sort. I recently found that like you can buy these old wooden mallets on eBay for pennies. I mean, this I think I paid like 10 bucks for this beautiful 100-year-old magnificent piece of wood. Yeah. Um, I definitely bring a thwacker. Uh, I definitely bring lots of different kinds of tape that might be difficult to find, like aluminum tape, uh, ceiling tape, uh, fiberglass tape, those kind of things. What else do I grab? I mean, for glues, the CA glue is the one I know that if I, like, again, you can find most of this stuff at the hardware store. So I, I really try and limit it. Oh, yeah. I bring things like... Um, my long alligator pliers. So these are like surgical pliers with a tiny little alligator clamp out here at the end. This is definitely something I frequently bring because when you've got to fish something out of something on the, on the, on the road, you really like, this is one where you're, this is the only thing that's going to do that. Right. Um, I bring a good pair of wire nippers, um, uh, and I frequently, oh yeah, for the Ghostbusters pack, I also brought an assortment of wire strippers, a soldering iron, and some lugs and electrical tape. Uh, no, I did not bring, I tell a lie, I did not bring the soldering iron because I'm thinking on the road, it's stripping and lugging. It's, I'm not worrying about heat shrink or like nice looking wiring. This is all triage. So maybe that's the best way to describe how I think about it. I think of like a road kit as mostly for triage rather than refined making. And I figure I'll bring tools that are hard to replace in the field and I'll supplement them if I need to with stuff I can get at the hardware store. It's a great question, Cypherian.